Welcome to the Tara Rochester Finger Lakes Science and Engineering Fair STEM webinar hosted by Finger Lakes Community College of Canandaigua, New York. Our guest today is NASA astronaut Robert Senker. Mr. Senker was a payload specialist on a space shuttle flight representing RCA Astro Electronics. On the left is a picture of Mr. Senker when he was on the crew. The center is their mission patch. The picture on the right is Mr. Senker as you will meet him today. When you look at this bio of Mr. Senker, he wants you to notice several things. Not only is he from the Northeast like all of us in the 2018 Terra Fairs, but he is also constantly learning from high school to seminary to a bachelor's and a master's in aerospace engineering to another master's in electrical engineering. Plus, he has taken lots of additional courses that didn't fit into a degree, just into what he wanted to learn. He told me about taking courses to learn machining, so he knew what was needed to make his work projects work well. He wanted to wire the network for his house, so he took a course in network design so he could do the installation. Mr. Senker loves to learn. These two people, whom Mr. Senker greatly admires, are more folks who love to learn. Look at New Yorker Dr. Mary Cleave, who went up twice on the space shuttle. She built model airplanes as a young kid and started flying when she was 14. She couldn't drive yet, but she could fly. And after high school, what did she do? Biological sciences, big systems, microbial ecology, microscopic stuff, civil engineering, building big things like bridges. What do you think she did on the space shuttle? She ran the robotic arm, a sort of jointed space bridge. Mr. Mario Ronco is another New Yorker, and he flew on three space shuttle missions. He went to high school in the Bronx, a bachelor's in earth and planetary science, a master's in meteorology, that's weather. He went on to be a state trooper for a while before his nine-year stint in the Navy. Then he was on to NASA, and with every new job, he could learn even more. This flight of Columbia was originally scheduled to occur in August 1985, but the timeline slipped. Columbia ultimately launched as STS-61C and achieved orbit on January 12, 1986 with this full crew of seven. Along with our payload specialist, Mr. Sanker, he's in the upper left corner. The crew included, going clockwise from Mr. Sanker, U.S. Representative Bill Nelson, future NASA Administrator Charles Bolden, Robert Hoot Gibson, George Pinky Nelson, Franklin Chang Diaz, tied with Jerry Ross for the most space flights with seven, and Stephen Hawley. be used in zero gravity. In zero gravity you just float around and it makes a lot more sense to go head first so you can see where you're going. You can imagine if I tried to go down the ladder feet first, I obviously couldn't see where I was going so I would bump into the whoever happened to be down there. So this is actually the way we move around in zero G and, and it looks like fun and I'm grinning ear to ear because it was fun but you're not doing it just because of that, you're doing it because it's a smart way to do it. And if we go to the next slide then, one of the common questions is food, and this is one of the surprises. If you talk to your parents or perhaps your, your grandparents, uh, they will remember when, when astronauts ate dried food cubes and paste out of toothpaste tubes. Uh, you can eat anything in space you can here. If you look at that closely, you'll see it's a pastry just like the kind you can buy in the vending machine. 
the big advantage in space is you know how you eat them from the vending machine and your fingers get sticky from the glaze. Well, you'll notice that I haven't touched them. I'm just eating it out of the air because you don't need to touch it. So the, the plastic bag is in my hand, but the, uh, the pastry is just floating in the cabin. And so I, I rather enjoyed mealtime. Mealtime was the only time we had to actually, quote, play on the space shuttle. Uh, most of our time was scheduled for work, uh, but that was simply the nature of the business. If you were in space, I'm sure your parents have probably put in days that lasted much longer than, uh, than, than eight hours. So you, you, if you're up in space, it costs a lot to go there. We were up for six days, and so we were literally scheduled for every five minutes at a time. Okay, and the other thing that everybody asks, so I have to throw in, just go to the next slide, please. I'm not even going to tell you what that is because I'm going to assume you figure it out. And it looks like a bathroom. It works like a bathroom. All I can tell you in the short time that I have is if I could live in space for six months and use that toilet, I would have no problem at all. It worked very well. It's, it's a very interesting bit of technology, and perhaps sometime I'll get a chance to tell you a little bit more about it. If we go to the next slide, we've got one more picture. This is the reason I got to fly. The gold and blue cube that you see up on top of that weighs about 4,000 pounds. That's a communication satellite, and I was the manager of, quote, systems engineering. If you recall early on, I said I was a systems engineer. What that means is I studied, when I graduated first, I was studying aer aerospace engineering, which was spacecraft orbits and dynamics. As I started working in the business, I discovered that, gee, spacecraft are all electrical, so I went back and I studied electrical engineering. And, and after that, there were issues with reliability and issues with thermal design, and I studied more of that. And so I became what we in the business call a systems engineer so that I could understand what all of the specialties. The reason I got picked as manager of systems engineering is there were a lot of engineers, a lot of engineers who worked on that program who knew a great deal more about the individual subsystems than I did. But if you only got to pick one, if you could only send one person along, then I was the one that was most likely to have had the conversations with all of those engineers to be able to resolve whatever issues we may have had. Now, it turns out we had no issues. This is, the, uh, this is one of the ironies of spaceflight. You prepare, and you prepare, and you prepare. And I just see this text, and I hope everybody can hear me, because I hate to think I'm talking to dead air. OK, thank you. <laughs> So that was the reason I got to fly. As I said, the, uh, the gold and blue cube is a satellite. That satellite actually operated. That was called Prime Star. It was a SATCOM KU-1. It was bought by Prime Star. And if you had direct TV to your home, or since you're all too young, if your parents or grandparents had direct TV to their homes in the late 80s, in 86 through 97, then it came over that satellite. That's what that satellite was used for. It was the first direct-to-home TV. Uh, satellite that was was ever launched. So if we go to one more slide, please. It's a sunrise or a sunset in space. And, and I put this in because it's the most amazing thing that I think any human being could ever see watching the sunrise and set in space. You're flying through all of those colors. All those colors are the sun's light. The sun's behind the earth. It's coming up. And the sun's light's being bent, diffracted, by the Earth's atmosphere. So all the colors that you see in a prism are those colors. And we're flying through them. And it takes about three to five minutes to fly through it. And so you go from complete darkness, you fly through all those colors, and then you're in absolute blazing sunlight because there's no clouds above you. And then you, in the other direction, it goes the other way. And every hour and a half, it repeats. You go around the world every hour and a half, and it's absolutely amazing. I, I hope, I wish that everyone could get a chance to actually see this. It's, it's just an amazing, amazing sight. And then one more slide. Ryan. OK, I, actually, try one more. Because since this is about a science fair, and we're talking about experiments. 
people tend to look at the resume and, 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 and what people have done and they say, well, yeah, but you know, you guys, you've had all this training and you know, everything, you get everything to work. No, we don't. This is a picture, two pictures of the, my first radio control model airplane. Before, I'm sure you can tell, and after, I'm sure you can tell that also. As I said in the slide, it's called learning. All right. Mrs. Woods and I were talking uh, yesterday about Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison apparently made hundreds, uh, the number was quoted, a thousand attempts at the light bulb before he got one that worked. And a reporter is, is supposed to have asked him, how did you persist through all those failures? And, and he said, this was just an invention that took a thousand attempts to get, to, to get right. And that's it. You have to start. You have to take that first step. You have to ask that first question. Why does this happen? What, what does this do? It might be, it might be the weather. It, it might be reaction time. When, my, when my, my son was in school, he was a, a computer geek, and he also loved sports, and he was fascinated by reaction times. And so he wrote up some computer code to measure people's reaction times to see how they varied in different situations. There are literally thousands of things. And I'm guessing, if you're honest with yourself, and this is, this is the challenge, you have to be honest with yourself, you have to think about what things have I really wondered about? What things have I puzzled about? What things have I thought, gee, why does that happen and, and why doesn't that happen? And you go for it. You figure it out. You experiment. It is a science fair project. And you don't worry about failing. You don't worry that, well, I'll never be able to do that. You know, if Elon Musk had said that, we wouldn't have launched Falcon Heavy a couple of days ago. So, you know, these are the things that you, you, you have to take the first step, one step at a time, and it can all start with science fairs. So I wish you all the best. I, I, I wish you all to participate, and I'm sure Mrs. Wood would, would echo that. And if you have any questions or anything now, I would be happy to try to answer your questions. We still have time left. And uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Mr. McCabe, and, and we'll have at it. We have a question from Potsdam. Uh, we wanted to know how much oxygen has to be stored on the spaceship. Yeah, I wish I knew. I know we carried enough. I don't know the number. We carried enough oxygen on a shuttle mission. NASA provided enough expendables. Oxygen is an expendable. That's obviously why you asked the question. NASA carried enough expendables for two days longer than your nominal mission. So we were supposed to be up for five. So they had enough air, oxygen, fuel, uh, water, expendables for a seven-day flight. Um, Melissa, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Have you been on any other missions besides the one you told us about? No, no. I flew for RCA Corporation on the last flight before the Challenger accident. And it was part of the payload specialist program, and I flew for that commercial spacecraft. And after the Challenger accident, one of the things that NASA did was they decided that they weren't going to fly any more commercial missions, so I lost my opportunity. I applied twice to be a career again after I flew. I applied twice to be a career astronaut before I flew. Then I flew for RCA, and then I applied two more times after I flew to be a career, and with thousands and thousands of other people, I was turned down. But uh, So, no, I only had the one flight. And we'll go to Adams Holy Family School. Go ahead with your question. Thanks, Mike. Did you get that, Bob? Why did you become an astronaut? I'm an astronaut. I've always been fascinated by anything that flew. Uh, God gave me a good head for mathematics. So you can't fly any higher than space, and you can't really require anything that has any more mathematics than that. So it seemed like a good fit. I've also always been fascinated by anything that moves in three dimensions. I tried to dive in college. I wasn't very good at it, 
but I love going off a diving board and just flying. Great. Um, Seton Catholic's question, Bob, is what are the effects of zero gravity on the human body? Oh, we're working on that. That's that's a tough one. That one I have a, a long a long answer for. Some of you may have heard the term space sickness. Uh, a lot of people have heard that term. I've had a lot of adults tell me that they can never fly in space because they get airsick. And we tend to think of space flight as being the ultimate airplane ride, so space sickness must be the ultimate in air sickness. And that's not it at all. It is the technical term is space adaptation syndrome, which sounds like a mouthful of words for throwing up, but it really is adaptation. You have to get used to it. You've seen the training pictures where astronauts are floating around inside the cabin. That cabin is a KC-135, and you only get about 20 seconds of zero-g in that. So you don't really adapt to weightlessness. You learn to move around in zero-g. Right now, while you're sitting there, a couple of examples, all of the fluids in your body are being pulled down. You don't think about it. You don't worry about it. It just happens. Your heart pumps more blood up so that your brain will function, because your brain needs blood to function. When you go into space and gravity is no longer pulling the fluids down, your heart still pumps the blood up, so your head swells up. I can tell everyone on the line that if you went into space tomorrow, after about two hours, you'd have a fat head. What I can't tell you is how would you feel about that? Because you can't learn, you can't train for it down here. Uh, I can tell you I've never been motion sick a day in my life. I've never been air sick, sea sick, or car sick. I was miserable on flight day one. I didn't get sick. I didn't throw up. I had a serious case of space adaptation. You have to get used to zero G. The good news for you is that it is adaptation. And after, in my case, it took me about a day. And the picture that I showed you from me going downstairs, I was upside down in the cabin. I wouldn't do that on flight day one because I didn't want to be upside down in the cabin. There is no up or down in space, but because I felt that way, I didn't want all of my visual cues to be upside down either. But there are a lot, and one of the things we're learning on Space Station from the astronauts who are now in space for six months to a year, there are long-term effects that we're just beginning to understand. You may have heard there was a lot of concern about bone decalcification because while you're sitting there, okay, your, your, your weight is on your bones. You're on your butt. You're on your legs if you're standing. You're leaning on your elbows, whatever. You're, you're loading your bones. In zero G, that doesn't happen. You're just floating. So bone decalcification was one of the big concerns, and, and we're getting beginning to get a handle on that. One of the things they're finding out now is that your vision, the interocular pressure, the pressure inside your eyeball, it seems to be changing subtly from the people who are staying in space for a long time. This is the kind of thing that takes like months to occur. So there are all kinds of things, and that's why I said there are a lot of medical doctors in the astronaut office trying to understand some of those things. Okay. Mr. Sanker, we need to just take a minute break. Mr. No McCabe, problem. some of our students have to go now to other classes. Are you recording our webinar? Yes. Wonderful. Um, we would like to post the video that you've taken the link at terrafairs.org so everyone who has to leave now to go to class can hear the rest of the question and answer session. There's a slide that should be coming up that gives the URL terrafairs.org. That's where we'll add the webinar link and those people who are leaving now you'll find your regional science fair at that link. If you're from the Northeast the Northwest, the Southwest, or the Finger Lakes South Central region, you're served by Terra Fairs at that link. If you're one of our guests from other counties, do a search on ICEF, find a fair. This was a truly astounding experience so far, and those of you who have to leave, make sure you sign up for your science fair ASAP. Those of you who can stay, 
you now have until 2 o'clock to ask questions. If there's an audio wrinkle, just go to the chat. And if there's any question, I'll read the question or Mr. McCabe will read the question so that right away, as quickly as possible, we can have Mr. Sanker answering questions. Sir. All right, so can we, Norman Howard School, do you have a mic? <laughs> Hello, can you hear us? Yep, go ahead. And we see you. I'm not sure why you're not seeing us, but if you no, can we hear do us. see you. Okay. Oh, yeah. What does an astronaut do? Give it another try. What does an astronaut do to train for mission? What does an astronaut do to train for his mission? Yes. Yes. You practice. You, 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 when you arrive in the astronaut office, by definition, you've had a lot of education. The formal requirement is a, uh, is a college degree in any area of science or technology or education. But most of the astronauts, I have two master's degrees. Most of the, a lot of the astronauts have PhDs or are medical doctors. So you arrive in the office with a wealth of background information. The training for shuttle astronauts and for space station astronauts consists of learning their vehicle. Uh, if you think about it, a medical doctor comes in and okay, now he's got to work on space station. He's got a lot of hardware there that isn't the human body that he has to work with. So you have to learn about all of those things that are keeping you alive, that allow you to communicate with the ground that you will need in an emergency, and then any experiments or special science, because if you're a doctor and you come into the astronaut office, you may suggest that I would like to study. I think that that this will happen in zero g if we do this. There are there are methods of sleeping. There they've actually made sleep studies where they they rotate people to see if they can come up with artificial gravity by rotating them. Uh, but that would be very small, and when it's very small, you can sense that. So you, once you have proposed and you get approved to do something like that, now you have to prepare for it and you practice. You practice, in the case of a shuttle mission, you practice flight day one, you practice flight day two, you practice flight day three. And when I say practice, you, you not only go through all the things that are going on, but you go through what will happen if something doesn't work. You go through all of the anomalies, all of the issues, so that you know what it is you're going to do if something does go wrong. And, and on space station, because people are actually living there, it's, it's more complex and it's more convoluted, uh, but it's still all wrapped up in learning the things that you're learning, uh, learning the things that you need to do to stay alive and to get your work done. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, great. Kennedy Elementary, do you want to go ahead? When you go to the bathroom, where does all the waste go? Where does all the waste go? The garbage, the food, we literally bring, we bring, we brought back everything on the shuttle. Everything on the shuttle came brought, was brought back to the ground because the shuttle would be up for one or two weeks and then it would be reprocessed on the ground. On space station, because things don't normally come back, there, there is literally a, a portion of the, uh, the space station that is tucked away in a corner and the stuff is packed there and when a supply vessel leaves the shuttle, if it doesn't have anything to bring back that needs to come back, the stuff will be put in there and it will literally be burned up coming into the atmosphere. Great. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat. Um, Seton Catholic would like to know if it would be possible for humans to create life or terraform on Mars if we had to. I'm not going to say it would be because quite frankly I can't fathom it. But the engineer in me can't say it would be impossible because the engineer in me just can't say that. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is a huge, huge undertaking. I mean, we are concerned, rightfully so in my opinion, right now about climate change and the effect humanity has had on the planet. But those effects have taken tens of hundreds of years to happen by the entire population of the world. 
And the change that we're talking about is so subtle that there are some people who claim it isn't even there. So for us to say that we're going to go in and literally change a planet boggles my mind. So I, I'm inclined to say, you're, if it's possible, I'm inclined to say you're not going to see it in your lifetime. I'm sure I won't see it in my lifetime. Great. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to grab another question out of the chat, and then we'll go back to the raised hands. Uh, Bob, do you float when you're sleeping in space? You can. You're not supposed to. Uh, they have sleep restraints that that you can literally tie yourself to a wall or the floor. Uh, the space station astronauts actually have their own little cubbies. They have a sleep area where they can close the door behind them, which keeps them from floating around. When I was in space, one night I was very, very tired, and I didn't feel like getting out my sleep restraint. So I just literally took the Velcro in my uniform, and I attached myself to the wall, and I fell asleep. Uh, hanging on the wall, and and Mrs. Wood might be able to get you a a, a clip to a video or, or Google Bob Sinker tell me a story at KSC, and and I tell the story that uh, at some point during the night I I turned and pulled the Velcro away from the wall, and so now I'm floating around the cabin, and and that's not a problem except that the air is always being circulated, and so you move with the air, and I mean you're not going to get slammed into a wall, but if you ever are in a, in a sunny room and you can see the little dust specks floating in the room, that's you. You're just another large speck of dust that's floating in the room carried by the wind. So it, it, you can do that, but the, the preferred method is to simply uh, restrain yourself somewhere, somehow. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, Elmira Heights, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yes, we have three questions all together. Okay. Um, so I know you probably get this a lot, but what is, what is it like up in space? Does it look how we see it, or is it totally different? I don't know how you've seen it. Does it look how you see it? Yeah, the video from Space Station is, is, is absolutely amazing. And, and that's what it's like looking out the window. I stayed up all night, all night just to look out the window because we were supposed to have a five-day flight. But our mission got cut short because we finished everything that we needed to do, and so they wanted to bring us back a day early. But then the weather was bad at the Cape, so we couldn't land. So they kept us up an extra day. So everything had been packed. We were ready to come home. So I stayed up all night and looked out the window. I had a <laughs> box of coffee on the ceiling on one side, and I had binoculars on the ceiling on the other side. And I'm looking out the window, and for eight hours, I went around the world. I watched a thunderstorm over Africa, and it looked like I was watching popcorn in a popper. You could see the clouds lighting up all over the place, and it was absolutely astounded. I talked to a Russian cosmonaut who was in space for six months, and I asked him when he got tired of looking out the window. I'm assuming, like everything else, eventually you're going to get bored with it. Eventually you're going to get tired of it. And he said after six months, he was, he was ready to come home. He, he stayed up. He had an eight-month mission at the time he set the record. Uh, so I've always told people, I'd like to stay long enough to find out when I got bored uh, looking out the window. Thank you. You're welcome. Next. Um, when was the first time that you went to space? I went to space in January of 1986, 32 years ago. Thank you. You're welcome. How do you drink liquids without them going all over the place? Imagine you had a sandwich bag. A Ziploc sandwich bag with a straw in it. If you inject the water into the sandwich bag, it's not going anywhere. And if you put the straw in, then you can drink it out of the sandwich bag just by sucking it out of the straw, and the bag collapses around it, and you can drink water. Now, a sandwich bag, and that's, it's not really an effective way. NASA has a little box, and the box is about this big, if you're watching me, and 
if, if you were drinking orange juice, there'd be powdered orange juice, or there'd be coffee, or tea, or something in that box, and it's got a soft plastic cover on it, sort of like the, uh, the sandwich bag. And you inject the needle into the corner of the box, and when you take the needle out, you stick a straw in, and you drink it out of the straw, and the bag collapses on itself. And I told people, you can eat or drink anything in space you can here. It's just a matter of how you get it ready. Think about this. Have you ever had instant oatmeal? Yes. Okay. You've had space food. The only difference between instant oatmeal and what we had in the space is how do you get it ready? You can't just pour it in zero G because it would float away. But if it's packed in one of those boxes and you inject the water into the box, it's the same as adding water down here. So if I had a box of oatmeal and I injected three or four ounces of hot water in it, I could shake it up to mix it, and I now have a bowl of oatmeal exactly the same as the stuff you have here. And now you're going to say, yeah, but then how do you, you're not going to eat that out of a straw. You're not. Do not do this. This is not a science fair experiment because your parents will be upset with me. But the next time you have a bowl of oatmeal or a bowl of chili, pick it up, think about this, pick it up and turn it over. What's going to happen to everything in the bowl? Can somebody answer? It's going to spill out. It's going to spill out. Is the bowl going to be clean or is something going to stick in the bowl? Everything's going to fall out. Everything. The bowl will be clean? No. Not no. Something will stick in the bowl, right? In space, it all sticks. Once you've added water to that box of oatmeal, you can cut the plastic and peel it off. And it sticks exactly the same as the stuff sticks in the bowl here. And you can put a spoon in it, and it'll stick to the spoon. And you eat that bowl of oatmeal exactly the same as you do here. So you can eat or drink anything in space you can here. It's just a matter of how do you get it ready. Think about it. All right. We have, one, we have one more question. How old were you? when you realized you wanted to go to space someday? That's, that's a tough one. If, if you, if, when I flashed through my, uh, my background, you, you, I spent a couple of years in a seminary. I thought I wanted to become a priest. And, and it wasn't until after I left the seminary that I went into aerospace engineering. So that would be somewhere in high school, high school slash early college days. Great. Go ahead, Messina. What's your opinion on the Falcon Heavy flight takeoff? Amazing. Amazing. I, you know, I, I have reservations about about Falcon and about SpaceX because they're pushing so hard, so fast. But they've done some amazing things, and and I'm I'm hopeful that you know that that they'll be the game changer that that Elon Musk thinks they'll be. Thank you. All right, uh, do we want to go to Norman Howard School again? We're here. We got one more question for you. All right, go ahead. How did the liftoff feel? How did the liftoff feel? You are way too young to remember, but you can talk to your teachers or, your, again, your grandparents if your teachers don't remember. At Disneyland, you used to be able to buy a book of tickets. And the book of tickets had, you didn't buy a ticket for a ride. You bought a book of tickets, and you got so many A tickets, and those were for the little kids, the kiddie rides. And you had B tickets, and they were a little bit more the B. You can imagine that you got A, B, C, D. When Sally Ride flew, her first reaction was that was definitely an E ticket ride. It is definitely an E ticket ride. The the acceleration, the noise, the vibration is is amazing, but they've lit four million pounds of slow burning dynamite behind you, so something has to happen. And it uh it was very impressive, to say the least, but it only lasts eight minutes. And the last minute or two is actually quite smooth because you're up out of the atmosphere and you're just, just humming along. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Uh, do we want to go to Kennedy Elementary School right now? How hard is it to fly a spaceship in outer space? How high, hard is it to fly a spaceship in outer space? How hard is it? To, to fly it in outer space. That's a trick question, by the way, for the record. <laughs> if you're saying in outer space, once you're in outer space, it's easy because you're floating. Then the orbital mechanics becomes one of mathematics and computers and 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 what, what I prefer to call planetary oh. billiards. Flying it to get there is a challenge because you go from standing still to 17,000 miles an hour in about eight minutes. That's a lot of energy, that's a lot of acceleration, that's a lot of force and stress. So flying it to get there, flying it to come back home is a challenge. It, and that's why in this country we, we typically, the pilot, commander, astronauts, are two of the best pilots in the country. They're almost all test pilots uh, because it, it, is, it is a challenge to, to fly those. And the pilot and the commander did fly the vehicle for, for, the, uh, for parts of the flight. The computer provided a lot of support, and the computer did actually fly it for much of the flight. But the pilot and the commander also flew the vehicle in those parts where you don't trust the machines. Actually, have, we have one more question. What happens if you punch water in space? If you punch water in space, you make a mess and you clean it up yourself. <laughs> Thank Those you. Are the, that, that's the rule. You have to clean up your own mess. Great. Um, so we have a couple chat questions I'm going to throw at you, Bob. Uh, Potsdam would like to know uh, what the best experience you had in space. And then Seton Catholic kind of uh, right along the same lines would like to know your most rewarding moment at NASA? I think looking out that window overnight was was absolutely, it, it's funny, it was, it was almost the high point and the low point, if you will, because whenever I travel on business, and I've done more than my share of business traveling, I would always look around, and, and when, my, when my kids were young, I would think, you know, my, my son, the, the, the sports nut, would love to go to this stadium. Uh, my wife would love to go to this shopping mall. My other son was a volunteer fireman, and, and he would be fascinated by this. And someday I'm going to bring them all, and we're going to go visit these things. And when I looked out the window, and I'm looking down at the world, and I'm thinking, I'm never going to be able to bring anybody here. Because realistically, that's not going to happen. I wish I could say it did. Technically, it's, it's probably possible. But realistically, it's not going to happen. So that looking out the window was absolutely amazing. As far as working with NASA goes, remember I said I work for RCA Corporation. It absolutely amazed me, the teamwork within the NASA organization all directed for the people who were flying. I mean, there were engineers, there were technicians, uh, there were people at NASA who would have given their right arms to fly. You know that. They, anybody that goes into this business wants to do that. And here I am coming from RCA, and, and they're taking care of me so I can fly. And not once did I get a hint of, of resentment or, you know, take care of it yourself. You know, I, I want to do this. Why, why should I help you? It was, it was just amazing to me from the suit technicians, the food technicians, the engineers, the flight doctors, the flight medical staff, uh, the other astronauts. It, it, it was an amazing to me. It was amazing to me how the organization pulls together. The mission is, is the most important thing. Thanks, Bob. We have uh, another question from Messina. Paul at Messina, go ahead. Go ahead, dear. Um, what's it like to be in a spacesuit? Say again, please. What's it like to be in a spacesuit? I have no idea. Jack. <laughs> The jacket that you see me wearing right now is very similar to the jacket that I wore on the flight. If you 
if you dig back into your history books and you watch the early shuttle flights, you, we were wearing uniforms just like this. Technically, you could be wearing the clothes you're wearing. That sweatshirt you're wearing right now, you could have worn on the shuttle. Okay? The shuttle provided a shirt sleeve environment. The one thing that you would need that's very special is a helmet. If you remember when we talked about the launch, I said the helmet is loud. You have to protect your hearing. So there were only two spacesuits on the shuttle for my flight. Two of the NASA astronauts, because it takes about a year to learn how to use a spacesuit. Two of the NASA astronauts were, were, they're all suit trained, but there was a suit for two of them. So if there were an emergency, if anybody had to go outside, they were the two designated EVA astronauts on our flight to go out and do whatever needed to be done so we could come back home. So I didn't have a spacesuit. If you watch the last flights of the program, they had orange suits that looked like spacesuits. Those were not spacesuits. Those were partial pressure suits. Those are worn by high altitude jet pilots. They provide you a level of protection if you don't have pressure, but they are not spacesuits. All right. Uh, Norman Howard School, go ahead. What is a payload specialist? What is a payload specialist? That I flew with a certain payload. That satellite that you saw deployed on the shuttle was the reason that I got to fly. I was associated with that payload. If they had continued to fly commercial payloads and RCA would launch, would have launched, we launched many commercial communication satellites, then it's entirely possible that I might have flown associated with those payloads. It means I did not work for NASA specifically. I didn't help fly the shuttle. The only thing I learned about the shuttle was how to take care of myself, how to take care of myself normally and in, in the event of an emergency and how to work with my fellow crewmates. But, but I did not work for NASA directly. I was associated with one payload. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Bob, it looks like we've got about two questions left. Um, let's go to Frigo at Madison in Messina. <laughs> Go ahead, ask. Um, have you ever been outside of the spaceship and what was it like? Did I go outside the spaceship and what was it like? Well, I didn't, so I can't tell you what it was like firsthand. But I can tell you this, one of the guys that I flew with, Pinky, flew out to retrieve another satellite on his first flight. And when we were preparing for our flight, Pinky and I were standing up on the tower looking down at the orbiter. You know, that big gantry, we were standing up on top of it looking down at the orbiter. And he said, Bob, he said, you can't imagine what that's like. Okay, uh, looking at you, you're, I'm sure you ride a bike. You ride a bike? Okay, you ride a bike. Thank you. Okay, the difference between walking and riding a bike, that's one difference. When you learn to drive, the difference between riding a bike and driving, eh, that's a big difference. The difference between driving and flying. Now, there's a big difference. The difference between flying and flying in space, that's a big difference. Now, the difference between what I did, flying in space, and going outside, flying in a spacesuit. Pinky told me, he says, Bobby, he says, you cannot imagine what it's like. He says, you are your own satellite. Here you are, floating in space. Over there is the orbiter. Over there is the Earth. And you're floating free. He said, it's absolutely amazing. That's the best I can do. All right, Bob, we got three questions from Seton Catholic. Um, what would you say to a young person who is aspiring to be an astronaut who has asthma? Work at it. I can't, I can't promise you that by the time you get old enough, that won't be a disqualifier. I don't know that. I don't know that it's a disqualifier now, to be very honest with you. But I can tell you this, if you don't work at it, you won't go. And how, I don't know how old you are, but on the assumption that you're somewhere between 10 and, and 20, let's say 15, it's going to be 20 years before you're ready. A lot's going to change in the next 20 years. And there, there, the requirements for me physically 
were a lot less strenuous than they were for the Mercury astronauts because we now know that we can survive that. So I would expect that by the time you're old enough to fly, the requirements will be less strenuous still. They'll still be requirements. And as I said, I, I can't assure you that it won't be a problem. But I can assure you that if you don't go for it, you won't make it. All right. Uh, another question from Seton Catholic. How cold is it in space? Absolute zero. If you get far enough away from the Earth, it's very, very complicated. There, there is no one temperature associated with space. The, because it, when you're in the vicinity of the Earth, which right now we all are, even in space station, we are in the vicinity of the Earth. We're 185 miles, uh, 200 miles up. I was up 185 miles. The Earth is this big sphere that fills between a half and two thirds of the sky. And it's a nice, toasty 15 degree C. So that's 15 degree C that you're looking at, and that, that's pretty warm. Outside of that, if you're looking at deep space, that's absolute zero. That's cold. But your backside is exposed to the sun. If you're in sunlight, that's really warm. And it's dynamic, because as you go around the world, you've got the sun over here and the earth here, so you've got partial Earth and partial Sun and partial space. And then when you go around here, if the Sun is still back where I am and the spacecraft is over here, you don't have any Sun. So all you have is the 15 degrees C Earth and deep space, which is absolute zero. So it's, it's very dynamic. Turns out thermal design, control of temperatures, is one of the hardest things about a spacesuit. It's much harder than, than the air pressure. We think of spacesuits and we think of keeping the air around the astronauts so they can breathe and so they don't die from, from that problem. And that's true. But a bigger problem technically is controlling their temperature. Because we generate a lot of heat, the sun puts in a lot of heat. But if you're on the wrong side of the earth, you're looking at absolute zero and, and you lose a lot of heat. So Mrs. Wood, I think we're running reaching the end of our rope, aren't we? Yes, sir. You're right. Um, I have to thank you for this amazing experience you've given our upstate New York kids. Um, folks, I'd like you to please wave your cheers and thanks to Mr. Senker. Your webcams are bringing all your rooms to his screen. Thank you. Mr. McKay, thank you for, so much for moderating today and please extend our appreciation to everyone at Finger Lakes Community College who supported your involvement. Would you please uh, go to the Terra Fairs slide if we can do that? If not, terrafairs.org is where you're going to find your place to sign up for your science fair, to find out how to do a project, to find out what teachers, parents, and mentors do to help you along. It's all at terrafairs, one word, dot org. And at the top, you'll see Rochester, Buffalo, um, St. Bonaventure, and um, Potsdam. Click there. All of you who register for your fairs, Please note, all of you who register for your science fair, any of those four fairs, you can be invited to another webinar next month, and you're going to find out from our astronaut, Mr. Senker, about talking with people about science and engineering. When you listen to Mr. Senker, you're listening to someone who has spoken to thousands of people, just like he has with you about science and engineering. Sometimes he's talking to kids in kindergarten. Sometimes he's talking to people who are doctors, who are government people that need to understand big issues. And when you do a science fair project, you have something that's big to you to talk about. Mr. Senker is going to be able to talk with you about 
how do you make that comfortable? How do you make it so that your joy at having done your science fair project is shared with a judge when he or she interviews you? And how do you tell people the story about the cool things you did and the cool things you've learned? So register for your science fair and you'll be invited to the next webinar. Now, get those registrations in as soon as possible. And Mr. Senker, would you like to say goodbye to everyone? Everybody there, listen, you guys. This is, this is fun stuff. It really is. It's, it, it's like playing in a sandbox. And you just have to, you have to get, get out from behind worrying that, well, I, it's, it's too much work, or I, you know, I, I, it might not do what I want it to do, or I can't figure anything out. Yes, you can. The only way you can is you take one step at a time. So go for it. Hey, Bob, just wanted you to know uh, you got a thank you from Potsdam. Thank you from Messina. Thank you from Seton Catholic. We hope we can do this again. I appreciate that. Uh, the, 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 it's been it's been it's been interesting. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> One more, just uh, Norman Howard School. Did you just have something to say, really quickly? Yeah, we had a quick question. We just wanted to know Go ahead. what how what, fast how fast the rocket thing can go. How fast you are going in space. Uh, roughly 25,000 feet per second. I'm not going to give it to you in miles per hour because that's the number that I know. I, I started off my career in orbits and 25,000 feet per second is the magic number. That's orbital velocity and it doesn't matter the space station, if you launched a grapefruit, when you're in a space suit, if you're in the space shuttle, if you are in low earth orbit, you are going 25,000 feet per second. Great, thank you. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. And of course, thanks to Bob. Fantastic. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or you're looking for the website, please find it in the chat. I'll put it in there one more time. And you're welcome to just sign out at your convenience. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>